second year in the American Visual Studies to introduce Suzy tonight. Okay, thank you for that generous introduction. Okay, this is, this is good? Okay, perfect. Um, uh, as you can tell from the title of the show, uh, which we, uh, Peter just mentioned, that I'm not one for brevity. So if, if the talk goes too long, I'm gonna try to kind of cut back as we go. So just let me know also, and feel free to ask questions throughout. Um, I'll pretty much be reading and discussing two uh, recent projects I've worked on. So maybe if we can get the slides too, that'll be great. Oh, okay, amazing. Cool. Okay, well, we'll just let the slides on the left see. Um, so again, thanks to Peter Semensky and Jesse Werner for organizing this event, and also to Blake Shell and Sarah Turner at Discecta, who I've been working closely with as this year's curator in residence. It's really wonderful to be here at PNCA and also to be back in Portland. I was last year for TBA for a couple of days. Um, so as I mentioned, today I'll be speaking about my recent and ongoing curatorial project. I can ca call this Progress to Halt, a project which was composed of an exhibition, a series of film screenings, presentations, and performances at Los Angeles Contemporary Exhibitions, which is based in Hollywood, um, which took place last year in March and April, and then we had parallel programming uh, take place at, at the Sirsak Museum in Beirut, Lebanon, where I've also spent a lot of time working and living in Beirut. So a lot of the research that I did there in the past years sort of has folded into my current work. Um, and I also brought the publication for this project, for that project here, if anyone's interested. So and then I'll continue to speak a little bit about a more recent, a more recent project called A Grammar Built with Rocks, um, which I've been working on in Los Angeles and which extends here in Portland as a series under the title The Politics of Landscape at Distracta, um, which is a series comprised of exhibitions, programs, and a publication, uh, which opens this Saturday with, uh, with a two-person show. And just some like brief background on my work, just so you get a sense of kind of how I've been navigating the arts as an independent practitioner. Um, um, I guess my work very much sort of is in, engaged in art and the intersection of art and politics, and that's kind of a very broad statement to make but uh, very much thinking about sort of surveillance states both within a Western canon and also thinking about um, uh, artistic practices that have taken on some of those ideals uh, based in, uh, um, uh, based in uh, um, Arab countries, uh, based in the Middle East and sort of the diaspora. So again, a widespread diaspora. 
So my research very much engages in the representation of images of conflict and trauma uh, that are often stripped of their original context in order to explore the way in which image circulation, specifically those of contested moments, uh, shift meaning, and by doing so, can perhaps invoke another engagement with the world. Simultaneously, my practice is very much interested in the aesthetics of politics and protest by way of signifiers and performative gestures that oftentimes appropriate the media's sensationalist tendencies. My practice kind of very much, and if I was to sort of ask some questions that I've been invested in over the years, which is very much gonna carry this year at Disjecta, um, thinking about how artists' storytelling, narrative structures, and strategies of dislocation call into question the very idea of documentation and by doing so, challenge the contested sites that surround the work. I should also mention that I've, for many years in Los Angeles, working in Los Angeles as a practitioner, starting very early, uh, you know, I, I don't know what early is, but I was 20, right? Um, uh, started kind of working in a DIY collaborative sort of mode that kind of some of those intentions have, I feel like navigated and still extended my practice now is things I hold very dearly in terms of not only like working with artists but also engagements with spaces and sort of thinking about uh, public projects that maybe aren't necessarily intertwined with like established institutions. Um, so I'm invested in collaborative exchanges such as through human resources in Los Angeles uh, which uh, I don't know if anybody has been there, it's, based, it's in Chinatown, it's a collective run arts organization which has been programming experimental and challenging performance works uh, since 2012. Um, and also uh, through, my, uh, through work I've, I've um, been lucky enough to participate in on ongoing projects with uh, long-term collaborators, most recently with Anthony Carfello and also Shirley Kalajian, who is my sister and we've been working together for many years. Um, uh, when we're developing an upcoming journal called Georgia. Long introduction, but... Uh, uh, we're, okay, we're moving on. Okay, so, um, again, brevity is not, it's not my strong suit, but I'm, I'm working towards it. Okay, so uh, this is just the project I mentioned. I can call this Progress to Halt, which was at LACE, an incredible space that's been around since the 90s and is focused on performance works in downtown when it started, like from Mike Kelly to Paul McCartney, and now has a life in Hollywood for many years. So a lot of names, but this is the cover of the book, the publication that came from this project. Um, so there were a lot of artists involved, but also what I want to impress by showing this is that the sort of the public programs, the presentations and performances, the artist names that are listed there were an integral part of thinking through the exhibition making. So thinking about ideas around like fixed works, but also thinking about other kinds of projects that allowed the space to be more performative throughout. And I'll kind of show examples of that. Um, and also the, that has also the contributors. So the writing, uh, the writers, the artists, and the sort of performer, the performances that took place very, very much sort of worked together to create a hybrid project, which I feel um, my uh, practice is, is very much invested in, sort of these like rotating structures that fold in on themselves, if that makes sense. But um, so the, the project, uh, which I mentioned, wa was focused on practices in the Middle East and North Africa, which the, very much was guided through independent grant I received. That's literally the only way that was made possible um, through the Andy Warhol Foundation. And it, it developed through extensive travel and research throughout the region in 2015 and 16. Um, the project considered gestures of protest, unrest, and what I deemed in incendiary exchange as a starting point to a conversation. The initial impetus was very much to explore the way various protest movements in the region um, was to explore, investigate, I should say, uh, and to very much also reflect on my role as an outsider, uh, and to reflect on how we come to understand these moments over time, and also what role the media takes in the representation of such events. At the same time, I'm, I, I am, and I, I was, and I continue to be very interested in how uh, Art, contemporary artists reflect, uh, specifically in the region, have dealt with such events in terms of making work around, on, and not only at the kind of these pivotal moments uh, in history, but also thinking through sort of a longer term project uh, that artists have dealt, that artists have taken on that I'll speak about a little bit as well. So again, as I mentioned earlier, a lot of these ideas were formed when I was living and working in Beirut in 2013, um, right coming out of grad school, I moved there. Um, during the time of utter and social political unrest all over the Arab world and in different places around. In Lebanon, where I was, the prospect of war and bombings was and clearly continues to remain on the brink, particularly with the violence being committed in and on, in and on Syria throughout that time and until today. 
and the unescapable timely effects in the country, which clearly live on with the monumentally atroci atrocious refugee crises. Ideas around how art could respond to a particular moment were constantly being discussed in bars and cafes. Um, to what degree it could take up a moment marked by unrest all around the Arab world, reaching out elsewhere into many points. And at the same time, how it could work to unpack a politics of protest and violence and whether it should even attempt to take up these concerns. Um, I suppose these larger concerns left me confused more than anything else. For me, uh, it was never an issue if art could represent the current socio-political movement, particularly of such a targeted region, or how cultural production could respond to such politically charged time. The pro However, the project was shaped as I continued to remain hyper-aware of the instrumentalizing aspects of global visibility through the media and through image circulation, which my work always comes back to, um, where images so rapidly lose their origin and frame of reference. Again, I should mention it is not uh, my goal here to offer yet another critique of representation, nor to take up the historical forces that condition such rep representation. But my preoccupation at the time, a few, in 2013 and even now, was much more simple. How one could personally take these considerations into account within a creative and curatorial process, as I began to ask myself, uh, what was my role in this moment, and not necessarily as an activist, speaking as an activist, but as a cultural producer, and uh, oftentimes for many people these things cross uh, and are more fluid than the, mark the sort of the binaries I'm positioning, um, or so, more simply put, as an engaged participant. That said, my practice kind of is constantly, or uh, it goes back to being more interested in art's more nuanced relationship to political events. Um, again, I, some of the reading I was doing at the time, which very much came into play, not only kind of being active as a participant, but also things I was engaging with that have come, uh, that, I've, that I keep going back to. So at the time, I became interested in the writing of early 20th century feminist thinker Simone Weil, whose work does not presume that the researcher has authority or anywhere near a universal awareness of the political turmoil in the region, and instead wishes to enter more gently, uh, taking on an approach of counterbalance, which she calls counterbalance. Vale believed that whatever the situation was, it had to be balanced against in order for us to see the larger picture. As such, I began to focus less on the overtly political and more on the philosophy, philosophy that endures in culture at these pivotal moments of societal change. So the project, again, going, so I'll be like weaving in and out. I, I will show some images, I promise. Um, so the project presented video, um, images, sound works, installation, uh, in order to critically watch and understand the complex stories of scripted and imagined act of protest and what, uh, what I was, uh, and withdrawal. I took up various contexts and then reimagined them, such as the Watts riots in 1965, uh, to protests in the suburbs of France in 2005, to everyday images of Gaza. The multimedia works and formats represented images of conflict and strife, strife stripped of their original or intended context. Considered together, they functioned more as dispersed, dispersed floating representations of contested moments that very much refused to stand fixed, and instead circulate and vehemently invoke another kind of engagement with the world. Um, maybe I already said this, but to repeat, uh, if I'm repeating, the project did not situate itself in a single locale and it very much pushed against that idea, like a single locale or center, or um, rather it considered a multiplicity of sites and temporalities through the layering of physical and imagined spaces where timely topics can sidle in as wanted companions through the lens of the visual. So the, the works potentially allowed for viewers to create their own readings and interpretations from the various contexts, combined with what they already have seen or stored in their memory through media representation um, and the traces of messages coll collected along the way. So um, this is kind of, as you walk into Lace, this is the first installation you saw, uh, you would see. Um, so on the left uh, is the title, and then on the right is a work by Alejandro Sasarco. I, I won't, I'm, so I'll only be speaking about a few of the works, but not to privilege one, some artists over the others, just yeah, matter of time, right? Um, so the project borrowed a its title from the drawing of the words, I can call this progress to halt, a work from Irene Anastas and Rene Gabri's long-term evolving collaboration called The Meaning of Everything which is a manifestation of their research through a series of notes, questions, and diagrams that trace and map the questions they have shared over the course of their work and life. 
So here at Lace, as you'll see, the works reappeared in a kind of a delicate pencil drawing on the entrance, which was very much a collaboration with the artists. So we were, uh, you know, they've done this work in different ways. It's never manifested it as a title on a wall, um, and, uh, and which they were more than open to. Uh, and that was really exciting. A lot of the conversations obviously happened over Skype. Um, offering both, an, so here at Lace, the words reappeared in a pencil on the entrance wall, offering both a suggestion and an assertion depending on how the eye can is read. However, I should also mention that the borrowing the eye in the project title didn't necessarily for, forego the we that must be shared in the larger conversation, but rather was an attempt to maintain a crucial tension between, the, between building the we based in a community of resistance and the I that stems from the personal and the individual. Um, raising questions around responsibility and organizing. So it felt very like, it felt imperative to have that as like, a large drawing, you face that, you're kind of confronted by that when you walk in, um, which, uh, okay, I keep doing that. Um, and sort of you can, t you can take your own meaning from that, from the, from the get-go. Um, so again, the artists demanded that the, no the artists in the project uh, demanded that the notion of progress be called upon, rethought and challenge, in particular, its capitalist logic of advancement. They asserted that the progress must be analyzed on an individual level as well as on a global context. So I'll show some just images. Um, this was the installation, um, and I'll go through a few of the works as I speak through it. Um, so on the left, Marwa Arsanios, whose work I'll say a few words about, um, and the blue image uh, I'll speak about as well by Rosalind Nashashibi. So, um, so this work by Jessica Kazrik, who developed this project for the show, uh, who's based in Berlin and Beirut, I think now. At the time, she was in Beirut. Um, her new sculptural sound piece called upon the notion of progress directly and adamantly, a continuation of her work involving dances performed by scientists and engineers. As a computer circulated within the exhibition space, so every day this was powered on and off, and during the gallery hours, the computer, which was on a, what do you, a Roomba? Uh, uh, was free to sort of roam around in the space, right? And obviously, okay, so, so along the way, it collected dust, so, which was collected and which was used in a later work of Jessica's. And so the computer, um, uh, the sound, I don't want to teach the army, was repeatedly voiced aloud, while its screen showed that of another, being of another computer being de -ghost, a moving object in protest affected by a human voice what the artist deemed a command line that is being performed. I mean, I guess you can tell there was a lot of issues with this work. <laughs> okay, so um, within the exhibition, a flexible, what I, what I called a flexible viewing space was conceived, which transformed the gallery into a site constantly in flux, attempting to perhaps replicate the aesthetic strategies employed by many, many of the participating artists. Um, so within the space, uh, which was kind of a space in transition, um, six different artists' videos were screened on loop weekly. Um, and the artists range from artists in Los Angeles to um, Jalal Tufi, who's an artist based in Lebanon. So they were screened weekly during, within this area. And this area also became a space where various like presentations, lecture performances, and workshops were held. So it was a very like program heavy intensive exhibition, but in a way it was very much thinking about how kind of also how uh, works that are kind of fixed or installed within a space can perform with works that are sort of um, have a more liveness or performativity or are obviously time based at the same time. Um, so in a way, these works transformed the gallery bi-weekly. And I, me I mentioned this example with the space um, more so to point to the way that my practice oftentimes imagine, imagines an exhibition engaging with a program that challenges a static gallery and instead produces an installation that is in itself performative. So um, this is boring, but I won't go through the schedule. Uh, so every week, literally, the gallery was sh uh, changing and not only works, but also in terms of sort of the content and dynamics that were uh, being produced. So. Khalil Huffman, who's a Los Angeles-based artist, was the third week. Um, Subversive Film uh, is a collective based in Palestine. That was, they were the last week. So that's just another image of that space. It actually, yeah, it was, it was a fun little venture. This is, this is it looking very neat, so. <laughs> um, okay, so, um, so I'll speak about, a little bit about Michelle Dizon's work, who's the work, the three-channel installation on the left. 
So um, with Michelle Dizan, who's a Los Angeles-based artist and activist and runs a platform called Atlanta's Edge, which is very much thinking about how to de decolonize education platforms um, through different ways of engaging in education and, uh, and in art making. So um, in Dizan's work, temporally, temporally distant events such as the Watts riots and the revolts in the Paris suburbs of 2005 are taken up uh, in her work Civil Society, which is from 2008. The video is from 2008. The work engages with the videotape of the Rodney King beating as a site of cultural memory and unravels its resonances across temporally distant events. So with these leaps uh, across, across time and space, the work, the work throws the racialized logics that dominate mainstream descriptions of such events into relief. And also by sort of uh, dispersing the images across three screens. This is not actually probably the best image, so let's... This image maybe is nicer, photoshopped image. Um, um, across three screens, it, the work undoes dialectical montage and holds open the cut in order to make room for the experience of loss, both of the loss of the men, the two men killed in the revolts of 2005, and the loss of homeland, family, and language marked by a narrative of second generation assimilation that comes out of the artist's own life experience. So again, she's very much thinking about how to, these different sort of political contexts that have been part of her own cultural memory and how to kind of bring in her own personal experience as a second generation um, immigrant and to think about sort of ideas around uh, uh, loss that, uh, that through a personal lens, I guess. So I'll show a short clip and then um, it'll sort of, a lot of these things are feeling abstract without video. So I'm just going to move to kind of to the middle, but hopefully it doesn't lose its, uh, so let's, so it'll be like four minutes, something like that. So imagine this on three screens, obviously. is a way, of course, supposed to be a way of purification, but I would say that in that case, it, would, it wasn't that much about purification, but about uh, contamination. There are all kinds of, you know, when you would see all this uh, cars burned in, in all those parts in the suburbs, it, it was a way to, also to express the fact that they were um, maybe uh, proposing a new scenario for those neighborhoods, and they were not uh, going to um, internalize the suffering, internalize the despair, and let it uh, destroy themselves from the inside, and they were going to show it. And it was going to be a national show, well, even an international show. the future, I see it. 
2005, an area known as 9-3. Three boys fear they're being chased by the police. The police check them for their identification papers, take them to the station, and harass them. They don't want to be taken in, so they run. Here are two kids running away from the fire right now with an air gag. Uh, are some type of material or not, I don't know. We saw them running through a parking lot and across a backyard behind a brick building and peering around the side of the building. Whether they were involved in the fire or not, I don't know. If there is a police unit in the area, if the command post has our picture, I would check the parking lot next door to the National Dollar Store for three... From the future, I see it. They run into a power station. Everywhere, there are signs posted. Enter and risk death. They hide. Soon, a blackout. The darkest silence. Too close to an open circuit, and two boys are dead. Okay, well, I think we'll stop there. Um. screen where are you okay cool. okay so I'll just I'll keep keep going um, uh, this just kind of gives a, a snippet of maybe how um, Michelle also very much is invested in kind of writing her own narratives or her scripts based from her personal experience and how that folds into her work uh, in a way that's quite like it's quite poetic. So, um, so her work considering the politics of visuality and visibility, uh, her project asks, what is forgotten, consumed, or destroyed along the way for both those represented and those left unrepresented by so-called advancement? And the more common inquiry, perhaps, like whose loss, who's, who's gain? Um, so the artists in the project do not conceive the image as simply what is seen, nor as something representative of truth. Rather, images are made up of a particular convergence of history, subjects, discourses, connections, and their complex relationships to one another. The artists reuse and reframe documents, facts, and found footage to nar narrate their stories. The works very much put forth objections to a simplistic understanding of representation, disorienting viewers to question the construction of their own subjectivity and the constructed nature of cultural forms in order to perhaps problematize their participation in political identification. So very much uh, understanding of this material is framed as malleable, uh, as images are deemed full of holes, partial, and as active producers rather than sites of knowledge. So I'll say a few words about Rosalind Nashashibi's work, which is the work on the right, um, an artist who I've been lucky enough to work with on a few occasions. Um, Liverpool-based Rosin Nashashipi's video work, Electrical Gaza, presents everyday scenes of Gaza starting and ending with images of the Rafa crossing between there and Egypt. Common occurrences such as men singing in a room, taxis, maneuvering, horses, um, being washed in the sea um, are captured, very much challenging expected notions of a war-torn locale. The montage scenes shot prior to Israel's assault on Gaza in 2014 are even more charged in the work by the intermittent musical score and the transitions from animation to reality interspersed throughout. Uh, Nashashibi's experimental documentary format dissects reality rather than, rather than attempting to represent one version of it. Um, and I can't remember where I read this, probably in an interview with her, but she stated that she wishes to portray the place as she saw it, but also to find a way to show something of its nature as an alternative universe. So again, a lot of the works are sort of going back to this like other world, this maybe perhaps not necessarily grounded in reality, but this sort of imagined space, um, the space in between that can't necessarily be captured, doesn't exist, or doesn't exist yet. So I'll show a short clip of her work, which is, uh, which I have actually the video of, so less, it'll be full screen. Okay. So I'll show just a couple minutes of this as well. Thank you. 
Okay, let's stop there. The sound is pretty incredible on that work. Um, Okay, everyone still with me? Okay, great. Um, <laughs> so um, just to sort of build on that. Uh, so utilizing such disruptive strategies, um, the artists call for a halt, um, going back to the title. Sort of this interruption provides the space necessary to reflect on constructions of political and social inequities that are pushing against sort of ideas around that form a status quo or a normalizing structure. They fur further uphold the agency of the individual and the collective act to challenge notions of progress that are subsumed within a neoliberal and colonial agenda. So um, I'll just kind of, another artist, um, Shadi Habib Allah, uh, who was just in Los Angeles actually. Um, his video work Daga leads us into, uh, from 2016, leads us into unknown territories where a group of armed Bedouins follow the unruly laws of the desert where rules pretty much have a completely different order. The codes that are communicated in the territory and the work are beyond a viewer's knowledge, but appear pr perfectly legible to the smugglers who remain invisible, yet disciplined in their communication tactics. Sort of the work presents, uh, which I won't show this work, so it's, yeah. Um, the work presents a covert exchange outside of bounds um, through the undecipherable shots, pushing against what is acceptable or even tangible. It points to a space that very much operates outside of a known or visible political and economic reality as the Bedouins in the work tactically evade military patrols while remaining underground. Okay. So we also witness declarations of love and desire, both political and ge gendered, in a shared public space through New York-based Sharon Hayes' video work, I Didn't Know I Loved You, from 2009, developed in collaboration with participants from Istanbul, who engage in a range of emotionally charged public speech acts in the heavily trafficked space of Istiklal Avenue, probably butchering that. So again, very much the, the work, even though it was dealing with the show, which was very much dealing with these sort of like charged moments and sort of moments of like unrest um, and underground exchange, also was thinking also like what kind of love and desire emerges during that time, right? Through these sorts of like uh, exchanges maybe that can't be quantified or defined. Um, what can what can desire look like, and what kind what can what can different kinds of love and loss at the same time look like, and be represented as? Similar to Hayes, Sharon Hayes's interest, the project attempted to embody a self-reflexivity, considering how texts, words, images, and sounds are subsumed by a variety of polit political struggles in various localities, all directly tied to ideology. I have a clip of this, but I won't show it. We'll go to the next one. Um, Okay, so the work I pointed to earlier, Marwa Arsanios' work, who I've also had the opportunity to work with on a number of occasions. And funnily enough, when I moved to Lebanon, I was we were roommates. Uh, I didn't know she was an, you know, I didn't know her work. I didn't know she was an artist, but sort of that initial. So we we lived together for a year, and then then uh, only after a couple of years we started sort of exchanging about exhibitions and projects and collaborating. Many years later, um, and she. At the time in Lebanon, she was running, running, running this incredible like project space called 98 Weeks. So it was also a very gathering space where a lot of people hung out during this time, um, which I believe doesn't have like a physical space anymore. Um, so advancement is also considered through the labor of the dancer's body. In Marwa Arsanias' video, Ol Olga's notes, All Those Restless Bodies from 2015, through dance, the work narrates a story composed of collected notes written while reading Al-Hilal magazine, which is an Egyptian publication from the 1960s, which was quite popular then, and thinking about the disciplined body and the building of nation states. So very much thinking through that connection of the laboring body. Um, Arsanios considers the history of President Nasser's modernization program and the new ballet school that opened in Cairo in 1963 with the goal of creating a better trained body for the country. Weaving three different kinds of dances, ballet, ma uh, modern, and pole dancing, um, the artist's voice narrates the relationship between the exploitation and the body's position of labor as molded by its constant training. So I will show a short clip of this. Should 
So a couple minutes of that. The body of the ballerina can fly. It learned to fly. After certain conditioning, it can do the jump in the air and fly. Stop there, maybe. Okay. We have 15 more minutes. Okay, good. Okay, so uh, <laughs> I'm always nervous about time. Okay, so also inde indeterminate spaces are expanded upon abolishing the truth of any possible version in the, in the exhibition, and very much privileging the imaginary, again, the unknown, um, the, the material that sort of can't be accounted for, understood necessarily. Uh, perhaps it can be pieced together in a logic that um, wasn't, uh, wasn't uh, one wasn't able to conceive of before. 
So in this work, uh, the, the sort of going through the back hallways of lace, and again, this, this, was a, this was a long installation, so this is probably the largest project I've had the opportunity to work on. So Athens-based Georgia Sagri's installation, Sunday Stroll, performs this ambiguity through a collection of images of recent news events collected by the artist. Reordering and changing them throughout the show. So um, Georgia actually gave a script for the gallery attendants to kind of uh, take some liberty with shifting and changing the images that are in the exhibition throughout the run. So they got a folder of images and images were swapped out as things progressed. So it again, became a space that was changing. Um, reordering and changing them throughout the show, her performative script confused whether a past presentation had taken place at some point, if the, uh, if the images themselves de depict historical documents or if they are depictions of factual events in the present moment. Sagri is very much invested in the experience of reinterpreting events repeatedly to reveal things that cannot be communicated, following the logic of Thierry Giles de Luz, um, stating one else because one repeats. Repetition allows for new meanings to be created by eliminating what is retained in one's memory, not to necessarily to bring the story forward, but because the story is too harrowing to be communicated otherwise. So to conclude with this image, image on this project, and I'll speak a few, I'll speak a little bit about um, kind of how things have evolved and what's happening at Deschecta. Um, so by deconstructing the images and their movement, the project potentially allowed for productive and ever-shifting layering of material that leaves the viewer witness to the performative gestures, symbols, and sounds now very much removed from the events from which they originated offering material for an, um, another reality, perhaps a life that could, have been that could be lived in another way. And just, uh, oh, so this is a kind of a close up again, so like from an image that was called from a newspaper in Greece to sort of protests happening in Russia. So very much, she gathered this material over Sundays um, from various different kinds of like uh, material from scrolling through things, producing things online to things she had in her studio, to something maybe somebody delivered. Um, so again, just this is just kind of uh, the different projects that happen throughout, um, the performances and screenings and talks that happen throughout the, throughout the two months. So this was the opening performance with Candice Williams and Josh Johnson. I was trying to find a clip and it's like nowhere to be found, but it's a, it was a, Pretty wonderful performance. And Dylan Mira, who I've had the opportunity to work with on this workshop, Elise, who will be, um, who I'll be working with, with Dischecta on the second show here as well. Jessica Kosrick, who had the moving Roomba uh, sound feed. I should probably get really upset if I called it that. It's not, it's a scul yeah, sculptural sound installation <laughs> uh, rotating throughout the space. Okay, um, so I'll s s this will be a bit sh shorter, and maybe I won't go through all of it, but I'll say a few words how things have shifted. So this was kind of like a project I talked about was like a project from 2016, and like it, it was installed in 2017, but very much was like end of 15, 16, and 17. So again, I'm very much interested in working on projects that um, aren't discrete, right, but that sort of build on themselves over time. Um, whether through the exhibition formats or publications or sort of writing, um, very much thinking about different mediums and formats that can sort of produce content around a certain research topic or a set of recent research questions that oftentimes kind of shifts or evolves as I'm working on something. So kind of like interested in the kind of, sl even though I, it happens to be an active moment, I'm kind of ve I'm very much interested in slower burn in terms of thinking through a certain set of questions. And again, that project very much, a lot of the questions there relay into this project, um, what's happening now at Destructa as well. So, um, so speaking a little bit about this, a grammar built with rocks. So during the summer of 2017, um, I expanded some of this work, which we, we just talked about, or I talked about, um, towards a new direction. Uh, which predominantly shifted during a one month long residency I participated in, in a small town in the south of Lebanon called Jazin. So it's small, it was a small village. Um, and again, somebody I had worked with in Beirut in 2013 ran this residency, so she emailed me, so it kind of happened very naturally and it kind of um, was, a, it was a 
it, yeah, it was a very important moment at the same time. So my time there allowed me to better understand the ecological politics of Lebanon and more widely by starting from a local context in order to rethink water and its flows as both impenetrable and penetrable. Myself and the five other residents at that time worked together to consider how and to what effects water contaminates the surfaces, paths, and channels it comes into contact with, and whether it is a fundamental resource for survival and a basic human right, or perhaps managed as a privileged supply in reserve for a select group or community. Okay. During this time, I also, researched artistic, I also took the time to research artistic practices that engage with ecological politics and its implications on sustainability by situating the discourse in Western histories of gender and race-based oppression and discrimination. Which is, uh, kind of, which is the research I'm taking on now. So as an extension of this, I'm currently developing a curatorial series at Distrecta, which uh, had its first iteration in Los Angeles this fall. In LA, the project entitled A Grammar Built with Rocks, which was curated with Shoei Kalajian, who I mentioned earlier as a, a long-term collaborator, um, uh, presented, presents artistic practices that trace the racialized and gendered relationship between bodies and land and question narratives of socio-ecological crises that contribute to the displacement and erasure of people and collective formations. The project was presented at Human Resources, where I'm currently uh, involved with programming and fundraising. It's very much uh, run as a volunteer organization, so we're, all, we're uh, it's, pro it's eight of us that are super active, and we're very much kind of taking on duties as we go, and we do it off hours in between other things. but. Um, this was definitely not off hours at that time. But, um, and the second part of the project was cur is currently on view at One Archives at USC, the University of Southern California's libraries. So. Okay, so, um, actually I should go back to this image. The project started, uh, the project actually started coming back from that kind of research residency and then coming back to Los Angeles. Um, uh, with research into the 1950s history of Chavez Ravine's evictions, uh, which was directed very much through our research at the archives at USC, and soon expanded with the following set of questions, which very much extend to the series uh, that I'm working on at Distrecta. So how does unearthing soil sediments, remnants, and buried life forms open up space for concealed voices and histories, and by doing so, reveal interconnected systems of violence on people in place. So these are just like broader questions that form the propositions. Um, what does thinking geography relationally rather than territorially, territorially look like? And then how do meta narratives of development, modernization and crises contribute to the practices of dispossession? So again, it's kind of the questions that were being raised in the first project, there's a lot of overlap as you'll see in terms of sort of top themes and sort of maybe approaches to some of these materials. Often um, artists who are working research-based, artists who are working within the archive, artists who are interested in experimental documentary formats and performance practices. Um, uh, and I, so I'm not sure uh, how many of you are familiar with sort of what took place in Chavez Ravine in the 50s, um, but the evictions in the battle refer, refers to controversy where um, the government in Los Angeles um, surrounding the ac government acquisition of land largely owned by Mexican Americans in LA over approximately 10 years, so from like 1951 to 1961. The result was the removal of an entire population of Chavez Ravine from the land on which Dodger Stadium stands today, which was constructed at that time. The majority of land was acquired to make room at the time for proposed public housing, though the plan uh, that had been advanced as politically progressive and had resulted in the removal of the landowners of the area was soon abandoned um, after passage of a public referendum prohibiting the, the proposal and then also at the same time a super conservative mayor uh, was elected in LA. So very much it was, the sort of set of questions very much emerged from the research into the archives. So Chavez Ravine became sort of like a grounding grounding for us or like a set of questions that emerged from there that later sort of redirected the project. So in the exhibition space, I mean, what you would see would be one image from this. So this is coming from the USC archives. This is a image of one of many landowners, right, being like forcefully evicted out. Um, but in a way, the, the texts that, are, that we're hoping to produce later, we're asking writers to also think through some of the histories of that area. 
So the exhibition, A Grammar Built with Rocks, appro appropriates its title from Martinican writer and poet Edward Glissant's writings, specifically Poetic Intentions, uh, Poetic Intention from 1969, as it looks to the way in which the landscape contains, unfolds, and narrates its own history. It searches for tra traceable fissures within these contested sites as an aftermath of violence and altering states of upheaval. The project uh, very much uh, aims to think with the land, uh, both materially and relationally, in order to unpack and historicize notions of waste, uh, toxicity, which is something I'm thinking a lot through now, and contamination as, as they relate to the politics of access, property, and land allotment. So these are kind of, again, I'll, there's too much to go into, but um, I'll just show some images to kind of get a set, sense of how the installation um, Came, came, came up. So, okay. So, um, so the exhibition at Human Resources con uh, considered the material, psychic, and social relations that constitute place as a site of knowledge production, as well as the below. So, what we were thinking about, sort of like below the ground and below the surface, um, as emblematic of both resistance and retreat. Together, the works expose the violence inherent in geographic processes of territorialization, privatization, and urban renewal uh, in order to offer artistic methodologies that surface, that surface buried histories and reorient practices to understand land as a barrier of re relationships, resilience, and memory. So again, the, the exhibition was very much thinking through artistic practices um, that are thinking through documentation, performance, and archival practices, things that kind of interest of mine that kind of keep coming, coming back through different exhibitions, or that I keep going towards uh, in different exhibitions and projects. So, um, the exhibition at One Archives extends this inquiry and it, uh, to center on the interrelation between body and place, exploring how discourses of value and waste, again, through the motifs of the toxic, the disposable or the contaminant, influence individual and collective spatial agency within the landscape, um, also within the institution and, the, and um, also within the state. So these are just some images. Um, Susan Silton is an incredible LA-based artist. Um, Adam Khalil on the left, Galaporas Kim, who I believe has been here before for a project uh, on the right. Um, okay. So I'll say a few words about two artists and then kind of show a clip and then conclude there. Okay, so this one. So the image on the left by Sandra De La Loza, um, she, who's a LA-based artist, often works in photo and, uh, and film, and also is an activist who's kind of involved with different organizations from Decolonize LA to Self-Help Graphics. It's kind of like a staple of an artist who's thinking through LA's history and thinking about different strategies to decolonize space uh, through arts production. So the Los Angeles-based artist photographs were commissioned for the exhibition. So this was the only commission. Um, entitled Ruins Near Chavez Ravine and Ruins Possibly Palo Verde, the photographs taken at different sites in Elysian Park, which is the valley that constitutes Chavez Ravine, attempt to reveal the buried history of the exploited area one image at a time. Sandra documented these images during her walks in the area. The photographs uh, allow, carefully allow the crevices and contours of the landscape to reveal their own erasure, erasure and burial. They very much, kind of going back to Glissant's notion, communicate in their opacity, so the right to not be transparent, right? Kind of holding on to that. And as Glissant writes, there is no landscape that is not obscure. Underneath its pleasing transparencies, if you speak to it endlessly. So De, De La Loza does not use her own words to describe the images in the installation, but rather a Facebook post by Rosalia Urias Munoz is exhibited next to the six images, which is sort of a smaller image uh, on the right. Um, in the post, Munoz uses a personal story to describe the Arachiga family's eviction in the Chavez Ravine battle, the relationship between Sandra and the, po the uh, Munoz who posted the Facebook entry, 
whatever it's called, it's a post, right? Is, uh, is never articulated, although we do see that Melissa M. Arachiga has liked the post at some point. So the Arachigas were one of the main families that kind of their eviction was documented and mediatized. So they're sort of, uh, Sandra's pointing to this in a very sort of like cautious, um, cautious way. Um, and so I will also say a few words about Adam Khalil and Zach Khalil's work, who perhaps might have a program at District, um, I hope so. Uh, screening program. So um, Adam actually I met when I was uh, a grad student and he was working at the library where I was studying and we just kind of like developed a friendship and then again years later, maybe like three years later, I had the opportunity to see as one of his works somewhere in LA and I was like, oh wow, that's Adam. So just to say like a lot of these sort of relationships with these artists have happened through um, meetings that maybe like cross time over, over a couple of years kind of running into their work and kind of being really excited by something that I've seen and then going back and continuing a conversation. So Adam is based in New York, for example. Um, okay, so uh, their work, uh, so Adam and Zach, they're brothers who collaborate a lot and they work with Jackson Paulus as well, who's uh, more of an academic. So their work, The Violence of a Civilization Without Secrets from 2007, investigates the recent court case that decided the fate of the prehistoric Kenwick man, which was found in Washington, Washington State. So um, just to give some context to their project, which is a long-term project, the discovery of the skull, which forensic scientists incorrectly believed to have distinctly European fe features, led to a huge controversy. Uh, nationalists took this as an opportunity to lay a claim for their rightful ownership of the Americas an opportunity to lay stronger foundations uh, and propagate deeper roots. But at the same time, the lo no local natives in the region called um, for an immediate like reburial of the bones. So went to court um, and ultimately, uh, ultimately he, uh, the, the skull was reburied in 2007. Um, so again, uh, I'll skip over some parts, but the film is very much again going back to Glissant to call for opacity around the knowledge acquired from these indigenous materials that land in museums or different kinds of institutional spaces and artifacts. Um, the information also called later and capitalized upon from these materials, as well as institutions' muse museological processes of acquisition, often determined by very prescribed legal processes. Okay, almost there. Okay, so just some images, give context. So this is uh, two works by Colleen Smith, which was Upstairs of Human Resources. Um, remote viewing on the left and grid on the right. And again, I mean, what, what I didn't mention in the Chauvin's review area was that before it became Dodger Stadium, a school was buried in the land, actually. Um, and the reason why so that was that, there's that history, and then Colleen Smith's work, which isn't dealing with Chauvin's Ravine's history, but she um, she uh, sets up a space in San Diego where she literally constructs a school and then buries it. Um, so that's an, it's, that's the work on the left, obviously. But uh, it's it's a very powerful work. But she also went back later and took those materials and discarded of them. Very much like aware of the uh, kind of what was becoming of that school. But um, and uh, and she wasn't she wasn't aware of the history then. But we ended we ended up kind of organizing a conversation with her and another LA historian. So those questions came up through sort of ideas around art making, which was super interesting. And then a, the, the show ended with a work by Regina Jose Ga, uh, Gallindo. And then the second part of the show was at USC. These are just some images again. Marwa Arsanios's drawings, who I showed the video of Olga's Knows the Dance Work. Um, so again, just to say a lot of the times, like I'm also very much invested in kind of building relationship with artists that kind of, that take, you know, like over years, right? Like being reintroduced to artists and kind of continuing with studio visits and kind of being part of the conversation with them. That's something that I'm really interested in in general. Um, okay, so so just some images and I'll show one clip. So these are this is at the archives. Uh, you can imagine all the hurdles of doing an exhibition where sensitive material. So this is work by Park MacArthur, uh, Shannon Ebner, uh, Pauline Baudry and Renat Lawrence, Toxic, so I'll speak about this work. So, okay, so their work was a film installation called Toxic, um, very much thinking about ideas around like toxic states and toxic bodies. 
So the project drew on the artist's ongoing interest in the theater of the ridiculous, performances by Jack Smith, scripts and films by Ronald Tavo in the late 1960s New York, which formulated an outrageous critique of capitalism and the normalization of bodies. In the work, the artists worked in close co collaboration with actors in a performative exploration of notions around the toxic and toxicity and contamination. It's like who and what has the power to determine a body or a space as toxic. Um, so the work revi revisits documents from the past, photographs and films, searching history for erased or illegible queer moments. It presents corpora capable not only of traveling across epics, but also of interlinking, imagining links, sorry, between those epics, so foreshadowing the possibility of a queer future. Um, the artists state about the work, the discourse on toxicity installs vi violent hierarchies between normal and non-normal bodies, between able bodies and non-able bodies, between us and strangers, middle class bodies and working class bodies. And what happens if another technology and its history, such as the film camera and images, instead of chemical substances, is focused from a perspective of toxicity? And I'll show a short clip of this work. I mean, the, the reason why also we were really interested in showing it at One Archives is that it has the largest collection of like LGBT materials. So archives that span, uh, I can't remember the number, but um, so in a way it felt, not only was our research at USC partially with Chavez Ravine's history, but it felt really important to sort of think through um, specifically this work, the reason why we proposed it at One, um, because of the way it's rethinking sort of our, our relationship to specific kinds of labeled or, uh, non-normative bodies. Okay. So this actually, we're gonna have it. So I'm gonna show something from the middle because I feel like it gives a better. Silicone injections. Mushrooms. A tripla. Selexa. Wellbutrin. Great Pacific plastic patch, radioactivity uh, crossing national borders, hydraulic fracking, opium, Tylenol, Aspirin, Aleve, Caffeine, Okay, unfortunately I'll stop there. But maybe, well, no, I have to show it, just because I was gonna say I could run it, but. I don't want to do a disservice to the work. Um, okay, so. Okay, I keep forgetting, like, it's incredible, right? Um, <laughs> uh, okay, so just quick images of that. And then, so these are just, this was used in the promotion and 
the vitrine of Im images of individuals from the 1890s in France who were sort of like deemed other or uh, were persecuted for different reasons. So I showed that. And then this was an opening performance by Dorian Wood, who's an incredible LA-based performer. Um, the clip of which I won't show. <laughs> but um, okay, so at Discheta, I will. Uh, I plan to extend these inquiries further into a series of exhibitions and programs that will very much build upon the other, expanding the dialogue throughout the season. And through a presentation of diverse research based projects, the works will present counter perspectives from various contexts to politicized insta instances of land use and development, um, which we'll be exploring on Saturday with Carolina Kaiser on Sky Hopinka's works. Uh, the projects will, similarly to a grammar built with rocks, will continue to interrogate the following question. How can the experimental documentary format grant these artists the ability to engage with people and speak both with and through their struggles and resistance movements? The program is invested in offering multiple perspectives on the ecological histories of marginalized and disenfranchised communities in order to gather nuanced and situated understandings of the natural world, but also um, of artificiality, of territory, and the bordering and appropriation of space. So and also, again, similar to both of those projects, an intersectional lens of gender and race politics will, will serve as a key thread throughout the works in order to draw important connections between the material and social dimensions of environmental issues and to investigate what radical ecology can, can possibly contribute to today's urgent discussions around ec ecological destruction. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you, yeah. Yeah. I mean, as someone who's like kind of working on exhibitions that with artists who are also interrogating some of those questions, or as, a, as an individual curator within these different settings? Um, more like playing with the ideas of like, how do you depict, and how do you depict the depiction of post traumatic land landscape yeah. or traumatic bodies without depicting them? Or if you really yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think like the fur, the what I would kind of okay. I think that's a really good question. Um, I guess what I'm really invested in is never like is never having a strong fixed position about any of these spaces or artists or their works or their context that they're interrogating. So kind of very much approaching these works as somebody who's first coming from an outsider perspective, obviously has her own history, has her own trauma, has her own reflections. But um, sort of entering these projects, I guess kind of what I was talking about when I mentioned Simone Vale's project, kind of using uh, uh, very, much, very much sort of accepting the fact that the researcher or the individual doesn't have the full scope or the full knowledge of an area of a space, right? And we're also working as cultural producers in a very specific climate, right? We're also working, I'm working in institutions. Like I, I'm not, you know, there's no, I'm not claiming in any way to have an activist agenda outside of that, which I think is also a shortcoming of my work, which I've been thinking a lot about, like how to actually start kind of how, how one can be able to do both, but that doesn't necessarily have to come into the work. And I think at the same time, a lot of the artists' works that I'm interested in and engaged with over the years are dealing with those same questions, like how to represent specific people without um, speaking for them, right? Without um, without taking on their trauma or without taking on their histories. And again, even an artist that I mentioned, uh, um, Shadi, who's Palestinian, he also has the privilege of studying in New York, right? He, like, he, he can leave, he can be there, he can be, he can be present, he can work within this community, but he can also leave. So I think just like the outright acknowledgement of those shortcomings as a practitioner is something I lead with. Um, and 
And I think a lot, what I'm also invested in is that a lot of the projects that I've been lucky, or have, I've been lucky enough to have the opportunity to even work on, often with like independent grants, right? Like, which is its own hustle and world. Um, um, that a lot of the projects oftentimes have public programming with individuals in the community, expanded community, right? That can actually address these topics, right? Like Adam actually was able to come to LA through the small emergency <laughs> grant we received. And he was in conversation with Jackson Paulus, who's the other filmmaker. Um, and we had a performance by Kite, who's an indigenous performer. Um, so in a way, it's these sorts of like being able to explore these topics in a way with individuals who are dealing with them, perhaps through different means, through different ways, in order to expand the conversation that happens in the exhibition space. And again, a lot of the times I'm like, shit, like I'm really not informed on this. You know, like there's moments that happen in, in a program that I know I catch myself. I'm like, oh, you know, like, you know, just to, I'm very aware of, I, I try to be aware of those sort of like, entry points in these conversations and who to bring together. Um, even with Colleen Smith, who I mentioned with the burial of the school, uh, she was in conversation with Raquel Gutierrez, who's an LA-based incredible performer, poet, and her knowledge of LA's histories, Chicano history is, I mean, is, you know, is much stronger than I could ever claim to be. So they were in dialogue in a way that was able to sort of further the conversation. But again, a lot of the time, like, this is a long answer, but a lot of times these conversations are held within art spaces, project spaces, from more DIYs to more sort of formal institutions. So it's also a question of like who the audience is, right? And like what, what does that audience serve when we're thinking about sort of larger political questions that uh, perhaps may need to lend themselves to like communities on a more expanded, in a more expanded field. So it's something I've definitely not resolved, but like I keep working this way, right? So it's maybe perhaps like, I don't know, like over time, some, some other ideas around that will emerge. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Questions? Else? No? Okay. Oh, great, yeah, thank you. Yeah, this was fun, thank you. <laughs> and I look forward to the studio visits tomorrow and Saturday. I don't know if any, any of you are in the room, but I'm really looking forward to that. Thank you, Susie. Thank you.